your life, Chairman. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, IP scrutiny evidence gathering session. Um, this is uh, portfolio four, uh, the community safety and public health portfolio. Um, my name is uh, is Jeff Jones, and I'll be chairing chairing this uh, committee. Um, I just have an announcement to make uh, regarding um, attendance at COVID-19 attendance at this meeting. Uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically. Uh, members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of this meeting are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch the microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish, uh, and cameras should be switched on if and when speaking uh, in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raised hand function that I'm sure we're all well used to. So um, that's my introduction. So once again, welcome to those watching on the webcast. Um, I will do a brief introduction to members of the panel. Um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start in no particular order. The list I have here. Um, Chris, Chris Alley. Hi, good, yeah, good morning. Um, my name is Councillor Ali. I'm the member for South Oxy in Eastbury, and um, I'm having a bit of trouble with my webcam. So if I don't get it on, I do apologise. But I'll try and get it fixed during the meeting. OK, no problem. Thanks, Chris. Um, Leslie. Leslie Greensmith. I'm the member for Goss Oak and Berry Green Division. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, John, John Howe. Uh, good morning. I'm John Hale. I'm the County Councillor for County Heath and Marshallswick. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, Terry? Good morning. Yes, Councillor Terry Hone, Letchworth South. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Steve, Steve Jarvis? I'm Steve Jarvis and I'm the County Councillor for Royston West and Rural. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Rena? Good morning, everybody. My name is Rena Ranger and I'm the County Councillor for Rickmansworth East and Oxley Park. Thank you, Rena. Uh, Sharon? Good morning. My name's Sharon Taylor and I'm the County Councillor for Bedwell Division in Stevenage. Thank you. Uh, Ron? Good morning. I'm Ron Tindall, the County Councillor for Hemel Hempstead St Paul's. Thank you, Ron. And Colette? Good morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Colette White Lowe and I represent Hemel Hempstead North East. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Steve, we have Steve Palmer here from Healthwatch. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Steve Palmer, Chair of Healthwatch. Thank you, Steve, and welcome. And uh, the executive member, of course, Morris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, Jeff, and good morning to all members of the committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Morris Bright. I'm Deputy Leader of Hertfordshire County Council, but here in the capacity as the Cabinet Member for Public Health and Community Safety. Brilliant. Thank you, Morris. We And uh, officers that we have here, um, Morris, do you... Oh, yes. Got lots of officers looking after me today. Cut the yeah. shields. Where are they? I've got... Uh, um, I think I've got um, the Director of Public Health, should be on, Jim McManus. Yep. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I think our Chief morning. Officer, Alex Woodman, is here, is he? Chair, members, good morning. Alex Woodman, Executive Director for Community Protection and Chief Fire Officer. And we've also got um, other officers, including uh, John Bolter here, but I'm sure the, they'll be introduced uh, as and when and if they're required to speak later. Lovely. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Welcome, everybody. So that's all the intros done. Um, and I think we'll just get straight on with um, we have circulated um, 
the questions already uh, to officers, so I'm hoping we will have um, succinct, brief but succinct answers. We have a lot of a lot of a lot of questions uh, to get through. Um, so, uh, without further ado, um, perhaps I can ask Morris. Do you want to in introduce perhaps just this part of the portfolio? Um, yeah. <clears throat> That's very kind. Yeah. Look. At the the introduction will take five minutes or so because obviously it's two directorates and then I'd like if possible for Jim McManus and for Alex Woodman just to be able to give you a brief overview as well. Um, it's it's that yeah. you've got public health and community safety. There are two directorates um, which are among the smaller ones in the in the council. But they do punch significantly above their weight um, and so it'd be useful for you guys to get as much information as you can. Um, and then we'll get into the questions if that suits you. Uh, the Public yep. Health Directorate uh, spends around £50 million a year. Community Protection is around £41 million a year. But the portfolios in both directorates understandably provide services which effectively reach people and look after people from cradle for, for, to grave. Very important for the county and our residents. And it's one of the reasons why uh, I spoke to the leader uh, when there was a new administration last year and said, I really do think these need to be brought together. And I think as you will hear over the, the, the coming hours uh, with the introductions, the comments, the questions and so on, um, it was correct and necessary to bring them together for the good of our residents. So let me give you a quick whistle stop tour of public health. Uh, every infant in Hertfordshire and their parents get a programme of health visitor visits and immunisations. That's over 13,000 families who have had face-to-face -face visits and health assessments for their newborns. 93.1% of reception year children have a vision and hearing screening. 15,000 children have, weights, have their weights measured every year. Every adult between the ages of 40 and 75 gets invited for a free health check every five years. There's 35,000 hours of school nursing time a year. We have 60,000, that's around 5% of our uh, population using our drug and alcohol services. We invest two million pounds in prevention activities for older adults to prevent them needing more intensive social care. We've invested a million pounds in domestic abuse response, particularly important following lockdowns and unfortunate situations we've discovered since people have been allowed effectively back out again. Major response during the pandemic, as we'll hear later on, we fielded every project manager on COVID during the first wave, and we spent 50 million pounds, core budget was spent on health, plus managed COVID contain and testing funding for Hertfordshire. Now in the first six months uh, in 2021, over 16,000 free testing kits for sexually transmitted infections were ordered online, uh, we had to move services, some of our very important services online. Uh, that resulted in 774 diagnoses and 4,500 prescriptions for oral and emergency contraception, and they were dispensed to women in Hertfordshire using online services. We were keen to ensure that we kept these services going, uh, even when others uh, had to be placed on the back burner. Uh, we oversee the immunisation of children and young people, and we've all heard and hear about that almost on a daily basis from schools and people, governors and parents. Uh, we have two and a half thousand people using our intensive drug and alcohol services. And 6.7 million pounds of the public health grant is spent on other direct directorates of Hertfordshire County Council in supporting them achieve their key outcomes. And over the past year, public health uh, put 140,000 pounds into the community safety units as well. So that's a lot of information. I'm sure we'll come back to it later. That's public health. Now, community protection, is divided and some divided somewhat further. Uh, it comprises of Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service, Hertfordshire Trading Standards, the Hertfordshire County Council Resilience Team, and the County Community Safety Unit, which is itself a jointly resourced unit, and that's run in partnership with the Hearts Police. So let me start by giving a brief introduction to each of these parts of the directorate. First of all, you have the Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service, which unsurprisingly is the largest element of the Community Protection Directorate. It's made up of roughly 500 whole-time firefighters, 200 on-call firefighters, and 30 control staff who are supported by a, flexible, a group of flexible duty officers and senior officers who provide the necessary incident command management structure to ensure that the service is ready to respond to even the most challenging and complex incidents. Our fire stations 
are strategically placed across the county to provide a swift and effective 24-7 emergency response to protect life and property by answering emergency calls and dispatching appropriate resources to extinguish fires, but also to rescue people from road traffic collisions, uh, water incidents, uh, deal with other emergencies such as wide area flooding, chemical incidents, and even the rescue of large animals. However, it's not just about providing a 24 hour seven emergency response. The service works hard to protect its local communities, often working with partners and other agencies to reduce the risk of fires and other emergencies. We place a great deal of focus on prevention, aiming to reduce the incidents happening in the first place and working closely with partners to assist the most vulnerable in our society. This includes a wide range of targeted prevention and youth engagement activities as well as education through partnerships with organisations such as the Hertfordshire Road Safety Partnership, the Prince's Trust and the Hearts Sports Partnership. Our fire protection team regulates the, the built environment to protect life, property and environment from fire. The regulatory role you will not be surprised to hear has increased as the ramifications from the Grenfell Tower fire and subsequent review of building regulations and the legislative framework that followed uh, seek to address shortcomings in the life cycle of a building. The primary tool used by Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service is to ensure compliance and advice to business is through a risk-based inspection and an enforcement regime for residential, commercial and industrial buildings. The team also carry out a wide range of other activities to protect the public and support businesses and other commercial and non-commercial organisations, including statutory consultation service to local building control departments, uh, assessing planning applications for domestic and commercial use, supporting operational teams to raise awareness of building designs and installations and risk, and working with partners to ensure the safety of events and festivals uh, that take place in Hertfordshire. And we were until COVID and will be again, I'm sure, a popular venue, a popular place to hold such events. Training and preparedness are a vital part of service life and the Joint Emergency Services Academy, known, known as JESA, which many of you will have heard about, with what's called its live fire and other training facilities, is the focal point for this activity. This service was uh, introduced as an apprenticeship in 2017 for the training of recruit firefighters. It's been uh, extremely successful in the quality of, oh, I'm, I do apologise, um, Sharon is, is complaining about the amount of time I'm speaking. Um, I'm just trying to give you a, a brief overview, it's up to you Chairman, I can I can stop it or and you can cut back my enthusiasm, I'll give you a bit more detail later. It's your call, you're the Chairman. I can't hear you Mr Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Morris. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I think Sharon's right. We should. Um, okay. we, we certainly had had the intro for the first part of the portfolio. Um, well, can I just uh, can I just finish by saying that, can I just finish, Chairman, by saying um, I like being told off by um, by Sharon. We get on very well. During, <laughs> we, were, we were together yesterday in a meeting. Uh, during COVID, both directorates have been the forefront of COVID response. Uh, and have been run on an industrial scale. And I think members will have appreciated just the efforts that have been put in uh, by our public health and community safety directorates. They may be more aware of the public health input, but let me assure you, as I'm sure you'll discover during the answers later, um, that uh, community safety was equally at the forefront. And I think we owe them and our service staff uh, and all our officers a great deal of gratitude. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you for that, Morris. OK, um, we'll move into the uh, ev evidence gathering session then in terms of the key lines of inquiries. So um, let's move straight on with our first question um, that I believe Leslie Greensmith is going to um, address for public health. Leslie, over to you. Right. right, lovely. How do you strike a balance between running the recovery and the response service concurrently? Um, and how do we ensure that non-COVID services do not suffer due to any uncertainties or major impact from COVID? It's a very, very good question um, because, of course, we talk about recovery um, and recovery and the shape and the format in which it currently takes part a place um, will be evolving and continuing to change. Look, we're essentially double running in public health. 
both significant and continuing COVID response, uh, as well as we're trying to run our priority services. We know that some of these services were disrupted during the first lockdown, uh, and we had to move, and quite rightly, we moved several of our services online. I mentioned one before about um, sexual health. Uh, we've regular prioritisation meetings, and officers are monitoring outcomes, and we have kept key public health services during the running during the pandemic. We've become quite well used to this in what's now almost two years. Um, we'll need to be doing this for some time because even when we do eventually arrive at what we call a steady state for COVID, the current biological assessments are that it will be start of business as usual, or it won't be start of business as usual for some time as we were used to it. I was on a call with a joint call with uh, Chris Whitty last week, and he made it very clear that um, COVID is here in some shape or form uh, for some time to come, maybe as weak as Omicron has been, um, and wasn't in any way trying to put a dampener on the cautious optimism of moving forward, but was very realistic about the fact that we may have to be fighting this for some time. So from a Hertfordshire public health point of view, the key thing is that we have to minimise the impact on mortality and illness. So our COVID work stream comprises the following. Firstly, COVID testing, the health protection board and meetings, uh, the programme management infrastructure, vaccine inequalities and uptake, very important. We know there are still up to 200,000 people in Hertfordshire who, out of 1.2 million who have not been vaccinated. And some of these in area, are in areas where there is social inequality. Um, and so we need to be chasing that and we're doing that with more pop-up services. Contract tracing, epidemiology, which has taken me about six months to learn how to say, and surveillance. We have self-isolation pathway supports. We have a schools cell, care homes cell. Uh, we have events guidance. People can come up to us and, and ask us questions. We've got guidance to business. We've got forward planning, which is very, very important at the moment. Uh, we diverted some of our clinicians from our services into clinical COVID response. Uh, there's mental health support for the impact of COVID across key populations. And I think just this week, the Just Talk Kindness Awards have gone out. There's the post-COVID health recovery. That's the muscle wasting, for example, in older people, some people who may not have gone out of their homes for many, many months, if not over a year, and haven't done as much exercise. So they may be ending up with issues as a consequence of not catching COVID, but of, of, of lockdown and rules around staying in. Uh, and of course, the adjustment of people with long COVID. We, we, we had figures of around 40,000 for long COVID uh, some months ago. We don't know whether or not those figures are still accurate. Could be more, but of course, some people, hopefully the effects may be lessening. We are learning about this all the time, but 40,000 out of a population of 1.2 million is worrying. So we need to have a proper COVID pathway support. And of course, funding, mortuary capacity, volunteer sector, humanitarian work, and so on. Uh, we have additional funding for the COVID response from several grants, 1.7 million pounds. And we've managed to fund as a consequence extra staff, the equivalent of 60 full-time equivalents employed on fixed term contracts to respond to COVID. The remaining funds, which are around £8 million, can be used in this coming year of 2022-2023. Now, where some closes had to be, uh, services had to be closed down, we therefore accumulated an underspend, which we've then put into a reserve to fund some of our recovery activities, because we don't in all honesty know how much money we're going to be getting from government and for, for how long into the future. In particular, that money is going into health inequalities, as I've referenced, and mental health. And we've also created a further reserve by charging the cost of public health staff working on COVID to a particular grant fund known as CONTAIN. And this additional 1.1 million will be used to support recovery across uh, Hertfordshire. Non-COVID services will continue to be funded from the public health grant. Funding, to be perfectly honest with you, is not really an issue. The risk, as in the first wave of the pandemic, is that our medical staff will get prioritised uh, into the National Health Support, uh, National Health Services response. In the early stages of the pandemic, we prioritised our services in line with other, other elements of HCC uh, response. For example, through our services, uh, we prioritised essential services, but we made sure that food and medication got to vulnerable people first during lockdown. So a key priority for public health is producing a transition plan for the future of COVID and an update will be taken to the cabinet panel, public health and community safety uh, uh, cabinet panel next week on the 1st of February uh, on the work that we are currently doing uh, and taking forward. Thanks for that, Morris. Appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure um, Jim will 
will have something to say on um, on the balance between recovery and response for us. Over to you, Jim. <clears throat> well, I think well, our exec member was extremely comprehensive, Chair. But yeah, yeah, I think I'd I'd re-emphasise the fact that um, Morris said that we were essentially dual running COVID response and services at the same time, which is true. Um, we have protected some essentially essential services, so sexual health, drugs and alcohol where people can die, health visiting where pe where children can be very seriously harmed. Um, we have protected those. The, the priority for us going forward, as Morris has said, is that we have to kind of get COVID somehow into business as usual for health protection. Now, that doesn't mean it's, it's not a problem and it doesn't mean it doesn't need response. It means, though, that we have to see it within the broad portfolio of everything that we do. This, this is our kind of bread and butter, if you like, um, health protection alongside health improvement. Uh, and we have significant challenges. Uh, and Morris has asked us uh, in revising the public health strategy, which is due this year, to make sure that we look at the health inequalities that have arisen as a result of the pandemic and ensure that we do it. So, for example, um, how do we ensure that, that people still manage to get contraception during the pandemic? How do we manage that people um, still ensure to get access to sexual health services? Um, there's also the issue of how did we get people to naloxone? How do we do suicide prevention? So, if anything, um, uh, COVID has probably spurred us on because of the, the impact COVID has caused. Non-COVID related excess deaths have been hugely high uh, in this country as well. And what we have to realise is that this false dichotomy of dying of or dying with COVID is really essentially rather meaningless, as the Chief Medical Officer says. A, a whole load of harm has been done by COVID. You can't run an NHS if the NHS is so busy responding to COVID, it can't do non-COVID. So it's in our interest to keep it low, but also we actually have to see things in the round. That's the challenge. Um, and I think Morris has set that out uh, very clearly. Um, is that helpful? I'm mean, happy to answer yeah. any questions in detail. Leslie, you yeah, happy with that? No, it's very good, very comprehensive answer. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, uh, Jim and Morris, for that one. Um, we'll move on to our second question then um, from Colette. Thank you, Chairman. Um, considering our stated key priorities and, and the uncertainty surrounding future joint funding, plus an increase in spending on statutory projects, what steps will be taken to mitigate the risks? So, for example, clearly there is an acknowledged key risk with regard to NHS funding and how this is used on our joint projects. So what is plan A mitigation? And if that fails, do you have a plan B? Thank you. I personally good, always good have a plan question. B. Uh, but in relation, to, in relation to, that's a very, very good question. Um, look, we ensure that full risk assessments are undertaken uh, and risk sharing agreements take place. So, for example, uh, on joint weight management work, we've written into agreements that if NHS money ceases, the service will have to be scaled back to reflect that. And we'll communicate this to them. And we've done this before. Uh, we've increased the size of our workforce. Uh, our strategic approach is to look holistically across the system, to lead, to influence and to provide resource capacity uh, to instigate change and benefit the health of the population. Our statutory services are paramount, um, but they are covered by ring fenced grants. The extent to which we provide them is determined by actually how much money we have. Uh, we're looking at some income generating schemes. So, for example, where we can charge for some of the data evaluation services and behavior change expertise that we provide. We've got some um, damn fine officers providing some damn fine data. Uh, and it's appropriate that if we share it with others, they make a contribution, which we can then ring fence and feed back into services. Uh, so that's a fairly short answer. I don't know if you want to get more detail uh, from Jim on this, but thank you for the question, Colette. Yeah, thanks, Morris. Um, yeah, I'm sure um, Jim will want to respond there. Um, yes, I mean, as Morris said, um, it's exactly as Morris said. I mean, in terms of some more detail on this, if you would like some more detail, um, it, where we go co-commission services with the NHS, we have risk sharing agreements. 
Um, so that, for example, if the NHS pulls out of its bit of good commissioning rate management, then that service is rolled back or it is handed back to them. Um, uh, the second point, I think, in terms of detail that's important to realise is that we also lead some programmes on behalf of the NHS, so population health management for the integrated care system. Uh, and we have clear lines of accountability there that the NHS has to fund its share of this work. Um, in terms of looking to bring income in, We've actually been very successful in bringing in extra money for grants. So 500,000 for suicide prevention, 300,000 for extra drug and alcohol treatment. Um, we are currently bidding for another round of um, the drugs and alcohol money to kind of look at um, care and housing needs for people. Uh, and uh, our behavioural sciences unit and epidemiology team, well, they've been used nationally. They've been, some of them have been on secondment to the University of Cambridge and to government and to the UK Health Security Agency. And while I think we were willing to do that for the greater good during COVID, I think going forward, we're going to have to say to some national agencies, you need to put your hand in your pocket because you're funded to do this and we're not. Uh, and it is, and although we benefited directly from you using stuff we created, I think it's time now that you um, gave us a fair share of the cost of that. I do think the future does lie in um, co-commissioning because the NHS has had a significant uplift in its budget for prevention services in clinical frameworks. Uh, and um, that's really important because you do need clinical services doing their bit. For example, smoking cessation in midwifery. We've done the bulk of the work in heavy lifting with the trust on that, but the money goes into the NHS. So it's not costing us anything anymore. The NHS are spending on it and that's an addition, but because it's a different organisation, you don't see the finances. But that kind of co-commissioning, partnership working, um, call it what you will, has got to be a very strong part of our work going forward and indeed already is. So if you see, for example, most um, care pathways for, new, for newborns uh, and most midwifery pathways, it's our work that's put smoking cessation in there, just as one tiny example. I'll stop there, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll take up far too much time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, Colette, you. anything to add there? No, I, I think um, I don't think other, that both gave uh, very, very rounded answers. Oh. I'm still not quite sure about plan B, but no. from what you said, um, the the way we are running things at the moment, it, you know, particularly with regard to the NHS, um, then you seem to have got all of the possible, um, not, dra not drawbacks is the wrong word, but possibilities of things going wrong do seem to have been covered. And I think that's really important for our residents. And thank you for the work that your team does, Jim. Thank you. Bye. Oh. OK, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on uh, to Rena. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, my question is, how will the impact of the ageing population and increase in health needs be managed considering the lack of future funding? Uh, thank you, Rena, uh, and thank you, Chairman. Um, let's just, before I answer that, let's give ourselves some figure, facts and figures. We're growing, Hertfordshire's growing. Uh, population of 1.189, uh, almost 2 million. So 1.2 million is expected to increase by another 175,000 over the next 10 years. Now, the demographics of our residents are also changing with an ageing population. So, for example, the number of over 85 is projected to rise by a staggering 137% by 2030. And it's also known that 10% of our population are living with multiple complex health conditions and this is also expected to increase. Now I say that because we're talking about people here, residents, human beings, and I'll be reading out a list now of what seems like some dry, um, dry ways of dealing with this. But it is important that behind every 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 subheading here, we're talking about trying to help these people and the numbers that we know are growing. Uh, and you said uh, we know that there's an aging population, so the growing demographic will put additional pressure on the county council, and particular. The, the buzzwords of our time, thankfully, adult care services, uh, which is finally making its way up the, the, the agenda at, at central government also. Public health contribution to this is we have direct commissioning. Uh, we have internal commissioning of adult care services and we have joint commissioning with the National Health. 
So we have, for example, our healthy hubs, uh, which many of you may have seen, hopefully some of you will have visited. We work on system outcomes as well, including population health management programs, behavioral science, and we work with partners such as the East and North Hearts Diabetes Programme. It's very easy just to assume that Hertfordshire has its boundaries and its borders and nothing happens in between or over. Those days are gone. We work with others, by far the best way of doing it. Um, and to support the ageing population to be as healthy as they can so that they can remain independent and disability free for as long as possible. We have preventative programmes such as weight management, nutrition programmes, physical activity programmes, such as our Never Too Late campaign to support this. Now, the NHS has a stake in all of this, and we're working with them to look at joint priorities and funding. And I think that's very important. It's in the NHS's interest that we get this right, and we have good partnership working with them, and we'll continue to push uh, on this. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, yes, thanks, Morris. Um, Jim, do you, do you want to add to that? Um, I think the probably the emphasis uh, for me would be on what Morris said at the end, which was the NHS has a stake on this and joint priorities. So um, as Morris says, we have a bimodal population in Hertfordshire. We have a young population peak and we have an older population peak. And um, this requires a system approach. You know, the, the 50 million of the public health budget is, is useful, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to the 1.7 billion the NHS has. Um, and we need to work together. So at present, there are several programmes going on that with Hills, we have a programme on healthy ageing for older people funded by public health run by adult care services. Um, we also have an older people's population health management programme in the NHS that public health runs for the NHS. And the point about that is we have to get people to age as healthily as possible. So we need to be starting before people leave working age in ensuring that they go into retirement as healthy as possible. So our workplace health programme, uh, our new programme with Eastern North Hearts Trust for Diabetes in terms of looking at redesigning the diabetes pathway to help keep people free of complications as long as possible and keep them well. Those are the things we need to be doing. So I think um, our priority in public health, Morris said we often punch above our weight, a lot of the non-financial influencing that we do because we have a statutory duty to advise the NHS on things it needs to do. And that, that starts with the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and works its way through to the advice that I give the NHS. And they have a statutory duty to, to take um, account of the advice I give them as Director of Public Health. Um, means that we do need, I think, system working. So Morris's kind of keynote of system working in the NHS and this is crucial. Now we have got some good work going but I think we're going to have to do an awful lot more to keep up with the um, the impact of Covid in terms of uh, avoidable and preventable disability in our ageing population but also actually the impact of preventable disability um, as we go on through life because we're we're seeing more and more people getting preventable cardiovascular disease and cancer, and especially inflammatory cancers. So inflammatory cancers that are linked to um, long term overweight, obesity, smoking are actually outpacing other cancers now in Hertfordshire, um, especially in our older population. So um, we have a big job ahead of us. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Irina. Uh, do you are you happy with that or I'm happy with that thank you very much I've taken prevention collaboration and education away and um, thank you for you lovely okay thank you okay we'll move on then to uh our fourth question uh Ron I think you're on the handle that one thanks very much hi Morris uh given the budget allocation for health improvement services sexual health services and drug and alcohol roughly staying the same until 2526 and your earlier statements that if uh, under the written agreements, if the NHS uh, back out of funding, services will be scaled back. Uh, how do you see the introduction of the ICS in July affecting the NHS, NHS contributions going forward? Yes, it's a very good question. And we're in a situation, as we know, where 
Um, there's no such thing as certainty now over funding moving forward. And we also not living one year to the next, at some stage, almost months to the next, waiting for the next announcements to come forward about grant funding. But we have um, buffers in place because of the a certain amount of forward planning that's been going on by our own officers. So whilst there's some uncertainty about funding because we're awaiting the strategy arising from what's known as the Black Report, we've taken a series of actions beforehand to enable us to improve outcomes within our existing funding. So last year, we were allocated a small uplift in our total budget. Uh, we're hoping for another increase this year, but we, as I say, we've not had a confirmation of our grant total for 2022-2023 yet. We've actually brought in new funding on drugs and alcohol via a new one-year grant of £300,000 to improve outcomes for the most vulnerable and those as, uh, known as living chaotic in chaotic lifestyles, because this particularly focuses on getting people stabilised, housed, supported and into treatment. And all of you will know that if you can help the vulnerable and those listed as chaotic, the costs, once you get them sorted, the costs come down quite considerably of looking after them because the amount of cost that they take out of the system in looking after those slightly vulnerable, in their vulnerable and, and slightly chaotic lives. Uh, now, as I've said, we expect that grant to continue, uh, but some things can be done within existing resources, such as redesigning, pa uh, redesigning pathways, additional efforts on getting naloxone to people. Naloxone is, a, is one of those drugs which, if you've taken an OPA overdose, right, and uh, you you can whack that into so the system. Sorry, I wonder perhaps whether we could stick to finance because, you know, this is the budget scrutiny. And I wonder whether or not, given that the ICS board is currently being constituted and is to operate from July, will they be taking control of the Better Care Fund and the public health parts of the Better Care Fund? Or well, are, have, has there been any discussions on other arrangements? Because we could actually have three quarters of the year left with, with funding disappearing. Without, without wishing to sound um, in, in any way rude, Ron, it's very difficult to explain um, how the funding uh, gets saved and spent if you don't explain what it is it's being saved yeah. and yeah. spent on. And if you can be providing services, for example, for ambulances uh, and others to be able to bring down straight away the effect of someone who's taken an overdose. That's a massive saving on anything that you need to do in relation to taking them to, to hospitals and so on. So any additional work that we can do with our drugs and alcohol strategies and so on is going to be part of the budget moving forward. Um, so we work with the police, we work with others and so on. Uh, most of our budget is spent on commission services, as you know, large contracts. Now, these large contracts have some flexibility to deliver projects built in. There are some smaller budget areas which allow us to scale up or scale down, and we've got um, additional integrated uh, care system funding for workplace health scheme that will be delivered uh, over the next five years. We're trying to be innovative, Ron. Um, we opened an additional sexual health clinic provision to make the service more accessible to those on the London fringe, which has resulted in a reduction of area recharges which saves money, so it goes back to what I'm saying here about the budgets, which we can then relocate to other areas. And we've also promoted online services, which are cheaper to provide them face-to-face, because -face. as you know as well, face-to-face -face services, on whatever it may be, are very expensive, whereas you can go online or go onto phone, et cetera. Um, it's, a, it's more convenient very often to the user, but B, it saves a lot of money. We're continuing to put 200,000 pounds of core budget and a further 450,000 pounds in, over the next three years um, to all the districts. So all the districts will be getting around £35,000 each year. Uh, that's a Hertfordshire district, all the boroughs and districts, to develop healthy hub provision. Uh, we see that as a local delivery platform and a key one for health. Uh, and they, got, they, own, they know what their local needs are and allows us to harness greater resources and local intelligence to be really effective. So thank you for allowing me to give a bit more detail. As I say, there is a lot of financials in there. Uh, but it's got to be about putting money in and getting good services out. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Um, Jim, do you want to add to that? Um, <clears throat> I think I'd, I'd, I'd probably say the following things. If you if you look at what Morris has said about transformation, um, we've taken a sexual health service that was two separate NHS trusts, um, with multiple, with one with paper systems and one with a computer system, they didn't talk to one another across the county. Um, in some really quite grotty buildings, um, in and we had something like twenty satellite clinics that were open part of a day a week. 
And we have three integrated sexual health hubs that actually provide their own on-site microscopy and labs. So you can be diagnosed there and then with something if you're in our labs because they will take the sample. Um, they are open five days a week and evenings. Um, they see more people than we have ever seen. Uh, we've got online services as well, and the number of people going into London for treatment or the percentage has reduced. And we've done all of that despite the cuts to the public health budget that were brought in by government. So I, I think I'm blowing the trumpet of the portfolio for a minute. We've written the book on service transformation of services, 60,000 people. The numbers of people using our services have gone up. We've got the largest online sexual health testing infrastructure in the east of England and the biggest, one of the, the four biggest in the country. Um, and we've managed that within existing budgets. So I think there are three um, solutions. One is transformation and genuine transformation and really doing it. And I think I think we could tell the same story in the drug service. Our outcomes have actually improved. We've reduced late HIV diagnosis from the worst in the east of England and one of the worst in the country to the national average bang on. Uh, and, we, and we've done that. Uh, uh, I think the second story is about ensuring that the ICS works jointly with us um, so that they um, pull their weight. The public health grant will not be going into the ICS, but there will be local authority appointees to the ICS board, which is yet to be determined. And I think the third story is um, co-commissioning and partnership working on stuff. Sexual health is a mandated service, uh, uh, um, uh, for example. Uh, uh, drugs and alcohol is seen as one of our top priorities. So if needs be, um, we will always do whatever we can to prioritise that uh, and seek co-commissioning with the NHS. A lot of what we do, do benefits the NHS. Weight management and smoking cessation actually cuts the amount of time people spend in hospital after operations. So there is a financial payback to the NHS for every person who quits smoking before an operation. The NHS on average benefits by five bed days. Um, therein, I think, lies our work in getting our NHS colleagues to co-fund us. Uh, it, hopefully that's enough detail because I, I, I'm conscious I may bury you in detail you don't want and um, and uh, don't want to, to miss the the, the signal that, that Morris is uh, giving about you. priorities. Yes, thanks very much for that, Jim. No, it's, it's, it's very good to hear the uh, sexual health hubs, the success, the success of those. Um, Ron, um, anything further you want to add there? No, I think Jim actually gave more detail about the, the I think, the, the negotiations with the ICS and, and, and the constitution of the board in July is going to be crucial, as is the future of the Health and Wellbeing Board and the Better Care Fund. So I think that the, the, our, our future budgets are all wrapped up in that. Thank you, Ron. OK, um, well, we're doing well on time. So um, Sharon, um, Sh Sharon uh, this morning uh, um, had, had some concerns. She had a question that she'd like, um, like you to consider. So uh, I mean, she's going to present that now. Um, obviously, if, if you need further details and want to come back to us, um, uh, with a written um, reply, all well and good, but I'm sure you will probably have some comments on it. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you for allowing my question, Chair. Um, I don't think any of us in Hertfordshire any any doubt about the magnificent response of public health to this COVID crisis. It's been um, it's been fantastic to be involved with. Um, the Community Reassurance Cell has done an enormous amount of work on the disproportionate impact of COVID on black and minority ethnic groups and some other minority ethnic groups like those with disabilities and learning disabilities in the Hertfordshire population. Um, my concern for the purposes of the IP is how that work will be um, taken forward and resourced to make sure we continue to address that disproportionality and mitigate any longer term impacts of things like long COVID, which again may disproportionately imp uh, impact on those minority groups. Uh, I think uh, it's a very, a very good question, Mr Chairman. I'm grateful to uh, Sharon. And now, and now I understand why Sharon was trying to rush me before, because she was concerned she might not get to her additional question. Uh, but yeah. we're ahead of time now, so we've got a bit of time. Yeah. Um, and as I said, you will have heard me allude earlier on to our concern 
um, around those. Well, we talked about health inequalities, but this is this is what Sharon's referring to. Um, and moving forward, as I have said, um, we've not only identified work that needs to be done, but we have to ensure that that work itself is done. Jim, would you like to just delve into a little bit more detail for Sharon? It may be want to produce a written response, but I like likely it is. I would under, I would believe that having the discussions we've had recently uh, around this issue, you'll probably have more information now for her anyway. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, Morris and Chair, if you'd like me to. Um, probably several points. The the first thing is um, you'll be aware that the, we had a scrutiny um, of um, Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic Health Inequalities, and I realise the acronym BAME is. It's not a helpful acronym, but it's the acronym that was chosen for that, um, but you know, by some of the communities. That's um, that reported yesterday, and it landed on the exec member's desk. And we have until the twenty second of February to produce a response. Um, we have funded a lead program manager, Carol Young, to develop a strategy for um, uh, health inequalities for. Um, across black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Um, we've, we have invested 1.5 million. That was one of the first things um, Morris did, was ask us to create a health inequalities fund to invest some specific money um, into health inequalities over three years. Um, uh, we are revising our public health strategy to look at health inequalities, and this will be a system strategy um, so we'll be looking at that with the NHS. Um, there is an the ICS has set up an inequalities group, um, which uh, includes um, uh, inequalities across Black, Asian, and minority ethnic um, uh, populations. And I should say that this is also about White Eastern Europeans as well as. So if you look at people who were more exposed and died from COVID, you're talking about Black British, Black African, Black Caribbean women and men. But actually, we also need to realise that South Asians um, had significantly higher um, challenges. Uh, we need to realise also that uh, Eastern Europeans um, were, were often also more exposed to it and because of uh, the jobs that they do. Um, we've asked every provider to ensure that they address inequalities. And of course, at the minute, there's a large vaccine inequalities sale that does nothing other than look ward by ward at take up of vaccination and where um, we work on that. So this will continue going forward. Um, you may also realise, and, and Sharon, I think, um, is probably hiding a light under a bushel somewhat in terms of the work that Stevenage did. Um, the, the 10 districts did massive leadership work funded by Health Protection Board. Um, and actually shared stuff. So other people have nicked pieces of work that Stevenage have done and that Watford has done, for example. Um, now, the key challenge is how we make that go forward um, in the funding. And those six strands of activity I've described are probably the start, not the end. They also need to feed into the county's corporate um, inequalities work. But, but that's a start. It's not enough. But but it's a start. Does that um is it, have I made that clear? I have a completely confused people with detail. Mr. Mr. Chairman, is it worth pointing out that um, there is, as Sharon knows, the the, the health inequalities topic group that um, Julie Billings has been sharing. The actual report indeed was published yesterday. I think I got my copy while I was in another meeting with Sharon yesterday afternoon. Um, and we've got our response due by the 22nd of February. So I think that there'll be more coming out uh, in, in the coming weeks. One point I would like to make, and I, I choose my words very carefully, that we don't, we must not uh, fall into the trap of assuming that all those people from, uh, from BAME communities, um, A, are suffering inequalities, and B, may not have been vaccinated or taken care or, or, or got COVID because of inequalities. There may be other reasons for it, and it's around um, um, language, it's around education, um, it's around history of understanding of, of vaccinations and so on. So there is a lot more nuanced work that has been and will continue to go on around this. That's not to say that we haven't got inequalities, and thankfully, if that's the right word, what this pandemic has thrown up uh, across Hertfordshire is where those inequalities are. Uh, and I'm, at, I'm very impressed by the work that's been done in both directorates 
to, to look into what those inequalities are and how we can address them, not just now, but as we, as we come out of this, because we really do want something very much more positive um, than we've had for the past two years. And if we can learn from, from previous emissions and, and possibly mistakes, then it won't have all been for the bad. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that I think that's a very good response. Um, and certainly, I think we look forward to the uh, response from the topic topic group when that's when that's released. Um, Sharon. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll read the, the uh, outcome from the topic group as well. Thank you very much for allowing my question. No problem. OK, well, thank you very much. We're bang on time. Um, I'm amazed, but there you are. That's good. Let's hope we can keep keep this going. Um, Jim, thank you very much for your time. Um, we're going to move on now to um, community safety. Um, Jim, you're welcome to stay with us, but I'm sure you've got um, uh, pressing matters ahead of you. Um, so moving on to community safety, um, we've got Alex is going to be the officer for this one, I believe. So welcome, Alex. Um, Morris, uh, I think you did the did your intro for community safety. Um, well, I was cut off in my prime, Mr. Chairman. OK, if you've got if, if you've got more, then that's that's fine. Um, no, I think I think in the fairness of keeping things moving, perhaps because Alex Woodman is a relatively new member of staff and there may be some councillors on this committee who don't know him perhaps as well. Perhaps let him say a few words about himself and they will understand better his background and what he's been doing. And then I can take questions if that works for you. Excellent idea. Well done. Thank you, Morris. Um, well, over to you then, Alex. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everyone. So I think a, a quick introduction. There was a, a brief. I was going to take you through a presentation, but in the speed of time, I, I won't do that because I think I can give you an overview. But uh, as Morris has said, I joined the county back in August, taking over from our previous Chief Fire Officer, Darrell Keane, who's uh, left on retirement. So I think where we're at as an organisation, we've moved through some uh, change in the leadership team. We're coming into a point where uh, HMI inspection are due to come with us or to join us at the uh, end of February into March. So a very critical point for us. Um, but a period of change across the directorate coming out of the pandemic, uh, and I say coming out loosely, but conscious of the current headlines and arrangements at the moment. But again, seeing the directorate move through that change and into new ways of working. So for me, an opportunity with HMI coming in to review our current method of operation, look at opportunities, look at ways of working as we move forward. And again, about embedding us even further into the county and sort of seeking the benefits of the fire and rescue side of house, being under the county's banner and getting the benefits of that enhanced per, uh, partnership working. So. Uh, for me, I'm going to say this, of course, an exciting opportunity, many opportunities ahead for us with the leadership team. Um, but again, we will move through HMI, understand their findings and their report and use that into our planning for our new integrated risk management plan that will cover us for the next few years. So hopefully a helpful introduction, but uh, here this morning to answer and support in any way I can to uh, our exec member. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, OK, well, um, we'll move straight into the, the questions. Um, so I think, Chris, I think you've got a first, first question for Fire and Rescue. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is my question. How will the impact of an ageing population and changes in demographic profile be managed on emergency response, considering this will have a major impact on the budget? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Again, a theme that's emerging from today's uh, a scrutiny is about the ageing population and I did the figures a short while ago uh, um, and I won't need to repeat them again because you will have all have noted them but it is something that we need to consider and the Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service as well as public health but now we're dealing with the community safety they understand the challenges these changes are bringing and they recognise that we have to work with other county council directors directorates uh, partners and voluntary sector to help manage the demands we're already working with telecare providers and promoting assistive technology to support independent living uh, and helping to reduce risk of those um, who are uh, in independent living. And one of the primary tools for assessing, recording and reducing risk is what's called the safe and well visits. Now, these visits involve direct interaction with residents in their home, which is very reassuring, particularly for the elderly, provides them with a range of information, topics such as fire safety, home security, uh, as well as health and wellbeing factors falls prevention. Um, vast number of, of very elderly people who end up in hospital do so because they've had a fall. Uh, healthy eating, smoking cessation 
and self from, uh, safe and well visits will often see physical and practical interventions put in place. Smoke detectors, if there aren't any there, fire retardants, bedding packs, some people smoke in bed still, some of the elderly, handrails and other fall prevention aids. And the director uses uh, a range of data uh, which we uh, determine risk and prioritise those that may need intervention because some sadly do. Now the very embedded nature of the Hertfordshire Fire Rescue Service within Hertfordshire County Council means that we thankfully have direct access to adult care services information. You'll all remember that historically there were all sorts of issues around different co uh, computer systems not working or not being allowed to interact with each other. Now some of those boundaries have been moved, those walls have been taken down, and we have the information on the vulnerabilities of people in Hertfordshire and helping to provide a risk profile of residents who may be more susceptible to fire than others. The County Council's COVID Recovery Fund has made additional funding available to increase the number of safe and well visits conducted by operational crews. That is also, if you like, a social service visit as well um, by the very, very nature of people going in there. So that helps also. And the Integrated Risk Management Plan affirms the services commitment to ensure that our prevention work is adequately resourced and the current practice of targeted interventions and working with partners to identify and support those most at risk will continue to provide the foundation of our fire prevention work now and in the foreseeable future. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, Alex, go right to that. Just a couple of points, Chair, if I can just follow up. I think probably uh, back to the, uh, the key point in the question, everything that we do in the service is structured around not being in that position to get into an emergency response. We're prepared to deal with it if we if we have to, but the prevention, the partnership work that Morris has spoken about, that early intervention, our safe and well visits, our best use of data, referrals that come in from the community, everything we do is structured around getting in that early intervention and avoidance. The specific question about you know looking at our aging population understanding, I think there's some other factors that we we do look at through risk management is that as we look at building safety, property safety, evolution of different building safety standards, that has an impact on the reduction of whether it be fires, damage, those types of incidents that we would deal with. And when we link and couple that with the partnership work we do with safe and well visits, exploration that we're doing around uh, Internet of Things, which is a new piece of language that's coming through, use of best technology, supporting people in their homes, getting the right risk information to our crews when they are out responding, either in a response phase or a safe and well phase, so that we can make that enhanced risk assessment. And I think building on that relationship that we've got across the county with adults, with public health, which you know we, we are linked in and bolted in across the services, that gives my teams the best access to information to give the best outcome for individuals. So it's all about mitigation, management and prevention, which is all underpinned through our IRMP and response that we have for the community. So I'm confident that we've got good measures in place and we are responding at the pace of how we see the population age as well at the same time. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I, I, I know these safe and well visits, um, they are very well received. I think it's a, it's a great programme. Um, I know residents uh, are a lot more accommodating for um, uh, fire service um, members turning up on their doorstep, um, perhaps rather than the other blue light services, but uh, it, it seems to be working really well. Um, so, uh, Chris, are you happy with that or anything to add? No, uh, they were very good answers. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to John, John Hale. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and Morris, thank you and the rest of your team for your time this morning. Um, succession plans, um, one of the risks identified in the portfolio is the changes, the firefighter pension arrangements, which could see a higher than usual number of staff leaving the service. And I think that's already happening. There's been, I know, at least um, two of the senior members of staff part of their reasoning for leaving was their their, their pension pots. Um, this obviously is a, a risk, it's identified as a risk. Um, how is this being addressed within the IP? Thank you, John, for your kind comments. Um, and also for your question, a, a, a dry but very, very important subject this, um, because obviously in this particular case, it affects uh, Harp Fire and Rescue Service, but it's not, we're not unique in this particular uh, aspect, this particular issue. 
Uh, the service does have a formal succession plan uh, with a number of tools attached, an establishment plan and a workforce plan. And these are both uh, these are reviewed at six monthly intervals by senior executive board. Uh, the succession's plan aim is to be able to fill the key roles effectively. So if a current post holder leaves the organisation, uh, which will ultimately lead to uh, ultimately lead to community protection, needs to have the right person taken back uh, over with the right skills at the right place. Um, and that way we can continue to deliver the service. Um, but that's, as you say, an identifiable issue is run around the, um, the change in the pension arrangements. And currently this potential risk does not does not currently appear to be impacting on significant numbers leaving the service, though this is being monitored by staff and being reported quarterly as part of a suite of HR data reports. Work is underway to prepare for the next whole time fire, firefighter recruitment campaign, 2022-2023. Initial engagement sessions are taking place now, January and February, and the application process will open in February and those cohorts are planned to start in August 22 and February 20 and January 2023. And we'll also be delivering an additional squad recruit training made up of reserves from the last campaign and a separate conversion course for on call to whole time firefighters to start training shortly before the new 2023 campaign starts. Um, that's still an issue because taking someone from from start to where they need to be takes time, takes a number of years. And, and officers are aware of that. Uh, members have acknowledged the financial pressures caused by the Court of Appeal judgment about changes to the firefighter pension scheme, specifically now requiring the sourcing of professional advice on options available under the remedy, which is anticipated will cost, generate additional costs to the service. So I can't pretend there aren't concerns because there very much are. I think officers are doing the best that they can under the current circumstances. I'm sure um, Alex will be able to give you some more information if you want, John, uh, but it is a, an issue that's facing uh, fire services across the country. Yeah, and obviously, you know, there, there is always the, I think it's twice a year recruitment at the, the fire officer level, but that takes, as you said, a few years for them to, to move up through the, yep. through the service. Um, and I think that my particular concern would be at the assistant chief fire officer level and the level below that. Um, where there is demand across the across the country because of these pension arrangements. Are we happy we have enough people with the silver and gold command levels that's required of that? And, and how's that reflected in the IP? Well, I'll allow Alex to answer that. But I would say, John, and you know, because we both sit yep. on the employment committee, that yep. we've had a raft of excellent candidates coming through in recent times. The difficulty is, as you know, with in generally, there are shortages of all sorts of senior staff across the country in all sorts of different areas. And we'll be dipping our toe into the pond or throwing our casting our net into the pond where other people will be trying to get this expertise. And what was particularly gratifying in the case of Alex and one or two other members taking them on recently, that were for once, instead of Hertfordshire or the districts and boroughs losing staff to London, um, people are coming out of London and coming out to Hertfordshire, which hasn't been the case that I can remember for a while. So hopefully the trend might be reversing slightly, but it is a fair, a fair additional question. And perhaps Alex, you can you can give a bit more detail. Certainly, and I just follow up, John, specifically on your point around uh, our management, incident command management. One of the things that I've introduced since I've come in is about expanding our uh, level four commanders, which is the language that's used. Um, and we've done that so that we've got a more resilient system that is in place and that's being worked through with enhanced training across our all of our principal officer team. So that's our ACFO's deputy chief fire officer and all of our area commanders. Um, and I think, you know, Hertfordshire has a very strong history of really investing its training in its across the board from firefighter right up to senior command. You know, it's known in the sector for doing that. It's something that I want to continue and make sure that we don't slip on. And I think it's following on Morris's point about, you know, why do we attract people into Hertfordshire? The message very clearly for me is that, you know, we are we want to be well resourced, well structured and absolutely well trained. So not only that we recruit strongly, but we retain, we retain people as well because of that investment that we put into them. So um, I, I, it would be naive of me to say across the sector that at certain leadership levels, we are seeing a moving feast. There is certainly an impact on the pension uh, situation. And, and I totally understand why people retire because of the impact that has. But I think the helpful element of it, John, is that it, it's a known risk almost. We know what the situation is. This is not a developing situation where we don't know what's causing it and we don't know how to respond. 
but specifically for, for us, I am confident in the way that we've invested, the way that we've trained and the way that we've positioned our leadership team to be able to give that command and incident response that the community would expect from its fire rescue service. Um, but this will be a continuing developing piece and we will continue to invest in that to make sure that all of our leaders are trained throughout the business. And I think I will just say we've got a very good, strong cohort of people coming through with our group commanders, our area commanders ready to go right down into our crew station commander level. So um, I'm not looking at it nervous, thinking that we haven't got that succession plan in place and we aren't seeing that talent develop through the business. Yeah, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Morris. Pleasure. Thank you, John. OK, thank you very much. Uh, John, you happy with that? Yes, thank you. Uh, and we'll move on then to um, Terry. Terry, if you've got a, a question. As a, as a previous uh, Paul Faraday holder, holder, I'm sure Terry very very knowledgeable on this subject. Um, over to you. You can be. Yeah, I mean, in, interesting. I know that uh, the, the uh, Chester and the Integrated Plan Plan in nature might be mentioned here. Certainly, noticed in the budget around the funding for Chester. Haven't got your camera there, Terry. And how much we? Your camera's not on, Terry. I'll let you see me if you like. We do. We would love to see. Try it. We'll see if it can come on. I can talk while the camera's trying to get itself yeah, on. Yeah, sure. Okay? No, don't worry. If you've um, got problems. I think you should have me now, if you're unlucky. Um, interested, though, on the funding for Jessa, and particularly how much we're putting in. There's a number in the budget of over 30 million, and how much perhaps we're going to get from the uh, the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, because it is a joint, as a, a session, as a joint emergency services academy. So we're wondering what the funding's going to arrangements are going to be and how it's going to fit with our budget and when it comes to the integrated mismanagement plan hmi yes we have uh, an integrated mismanagement plan which i think is two, two years old now an hmi inspector yes we have a recent one or lots of recent one around covid but prior to that we had a, a in-depth inspection which came up with some quite some questioning uh, comments for us we've got to link the two together are we sure they're linked together and the impact they will have on the budget because we have to make sure that our integrated risk management plan does reflect what our managers inspectors want us to do, and we have to build that into our processes and therefore our costs. So that's why I'm asking the links between those and the funding of JESA, how that's going to operate. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank, in, in the case of Terry Hone, uh, big shoes to fill. Actually, in the case of Terry Hone, very big shoes to fill because I've got these small feet. Um, but I think it's very important. I was sat on his, uh, sat on his panel. And I know the uh, attention that he paid to it uh, over the years. What I'll do is I'll just give uh, an overview and then let Alex come in with the detail, because this is a very important part of, of the questioning for this particular area, uh, not just financially, but around services and with a test coming uh, with an inspect, uh, inspection coming. So again, we've got some new people on, 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 on council and people watching this. So look, the JESA is the joint, as you've written here, the Joint Emergency Services Academy. Uh, and as part of the review of our collaboration arrangements, we're reviewing and we're looking at all the estates projects, particularly when they relate, relate to possible blue light integration, uh, which is something that we've been talking, that's been talked about for quite, quite some time. Given the financial pressures, and Alex will go into them in a moment, and the potential increase in borrowing, um, there has to be alternative design options for delivering the scheme, and they're currently being looked at. In the meantime, the live fire training, and many of us have been down there to see that, has recently been upgraded and the site continues to meet the service's immediate needs. The integrated risk management plan, we're, as Terry rightly says, we are required to produce one of these that identifies and accesses all foreseeable fire and rescue related risks that could uh, uh, affect communities. And each IOMP must demonstrate how prevention, uh, protection and risk uh, response activities will be best used to mitigate the risk on its communities. Now, the current IRMP runs through, I think, till 2020, 2024 and includes a set of proposals for introducing changes on how the service operates and manages those risks. And that all has cost implications. Some of those proposals are already complete, like the fire cover review, um, which I've just received a copy of. Officers took it, took, took me through it the other day, an extraordinary 135 page document. Uh, and I wouldn't normally recommend to anyone a 135 page document, but the level of detail in here uh, about the work that's done, the fires, where, where they take place, uh, fire response times and so on, 
is absolutely fascinating. And I've literally got my hard copy yesterday, and I hope that that will be able to go out to members uh, as soon as possible. Um, so we've done that, uh, and we're trying all sorts of different fire appliances now, as well as rapid response vehicles. Um, the IRMP will have the effect of distributing, redistributing resources to improve performance, and it will also allow for more flexible approach. But we are clear that we operate within a cost envelope. Uh, there are no specific saving requirements that need to be met through uh, this IRMP, but any potential savings, save positions, uh, will be redistributed to improve performance. They won't be handed back into the general coffers. They'll be used to redistribute uh, and to improve performance, efficiency and effectiveness across prevention, protection and response um, to ensure that all our services resources are properly aligned. And if you have a look, I think this service has already made a saving of a quarter of a million pounds, £250,000 from 21-22 against the current changes set out within the current IRMP and no further savings have been identified from the delivery of the remaining proposals. And again, Alex can come into that. So finally, for me on this, the uh, we don't know yet what the impact of the budget is going to be uh, or, or the impact on the budget is going to be from the fire inspection. We are about to have a fire inspection. Um, the inspectorate does not set policy, but it makes uh, judgments on the three pillars uh, of inspection. How effective is HFRS? At keeping people safe and secure from fire and other risks, how efficient is it at keeping people safe and secure, and how well does it look after its people? Um, we would expect to manage the outcome of any inspection and any subsequent recommendations within existing budgets. We'll know more about that further down the line. A lot of preparation work is going in. I've sat as have officers with the inspector for an initial discussion. They're coming in in February uh, to start their inspection. One thing the inspector said, he says, do not be chasing numbers, do not be chasing points or scores, just show us what your service is, uh, we'll tell you what we think, and then you can act accordingly. I think that's very, very important um, that we understand that, and they understand that too. Alex, did you want to give any more actual number detail to keep Terry uh, happy? I'll come in, Morris, if I can, and just if I can, I touch on Jessa first of all, Terry. That you know, as you know, this is a significant capital expenditure for the county. It's a critical uh, service that we need to train our firefighters. The review that I've undertaken, I think, it is quite right with any new person coming into my post. And I think you know, this program was commissioned uh, a number of years ago, and we've seen a significant impact of the pandemic. That has a review on all of our corporate property strategy and how we approach the next phase of where we build, where we locate and how we train our firefighters. So the review around Jessa is not around the principles of delivering fire training. It's around understanding that we're getting the best opportunity for the county. Um, the relationship with the PCC and the commitment of the money is still there and we are working through that MOU collaboration relationship. And I think it's a, a you know very, very strong partnership and we're already seeing a lot of delivery come out of that MOU. The commitment uh, that has been made and has been discussed in Cabinet towards funding live fire training is there. We've recently had the new plans come through of what that service provision will look like. Um, arguably, my line is I think it will be one of the best live fire training facilities that we have in the country um, and that will be uh, delivered. What I'm looking at is understanding the best value for the sites, the asset that we've got across the county to ensure that that due diligence has been done. So um, it's not a specific answer, Terry, because the review is still underway and we are looking at a number of those options and colleagues in corporate property are supporting me with looking at a number of sites and locations. Once we've had that, I can respond to you specifically and update you on the, the details and direction of travel with Jessa. But I'm absolutely confident that we will be delivering a fit for the future live fire training facility for the county that meets the standards that we'd expect for our firefighters and what they have to deal with and train for. Um, second to that, I think picking up on the IRMP point, um, as you know, Terry, IRMP is not a budget setting document. It's about our contract, the community, about how we manage and we respond to risk and ensuring we identify risk. Um, we don't use it as a method to make savings and that's not the spirit that we're moving into the fire cover review that Morris has touched on the document that's been reported. It is about truly understanding our risk for the community and I think coming back to our last HMI inspection before I come in on it, 
we did receive uh, a positive response about our ability to respond and our ability to protect the community. So that was a good response for us within it. There are some other areas that are uh, going to be developing and we're moving into the X HMI stage. And likewise, that's not a budget setting exercise. That's about ensuring that we are delivering of the principles of how effective, efficient and how well we look after its people. We're confident going into that next phase of inspection. We have taken stock of the, the previous HMI report and recommendations and the team are working closely at the moment to make sure that we can give a very robust and strong response to HMI to demonstrate the, I would say, excellent work that's been delivered over the last few years and will continue into the future. Thank you. I'm going to come back again. I didn't mention anything about savings and must. Sorry. Um, I talk about investment, really. I, I, I didn't talk about savings. I talked about investment in those, those sorts of services and the impact it's going to have. I did not expect the JESA or the Integrated Risk Management HMI to create savings efficiencies in terms of financial efficiencies, but certainly the concern you have, I have is what impact, and you mentioned one is on JESA, we don't know the impact it's going to have on the budget of the arrangements with the, um, the Police and Crime Commissioner, so that's outstanding, going to continue to be so. Similarly with the HMI, um, we don't know what they're going to say to us, and therefore we can't put in our budgets what we think uh, we may have to spend in order to get to the standards which we like to achieve according to the HMI rather than what we might think we want to do, which I know often match and often there's dichotomies between the two. A similar integrated risk management plan, which must of course reflect many, many things. It is integrated, it is a risk plan, but it does include things like um, number of uh, crew members, for example. It does include things like um, smaller vehicles, for example, and, and they have an impact on the budgets because certainly development of small vehicles and also is there an impact because of going, for example, from to five to four uh, crewing. So there are some impacts of uh, integrated risk management plan, which I know are not always significant, but I'm sure they've been taken into account. So on that basis, thank you for your comments, but we we still stand waiting to see what uh, the JESA and the HMI stroke JMP link up is going to be and the impact that could have on our budget which hopefully won't be substantial, but it's not in there at the moment and it may well need to be in the future. So thank you. Okay, um, thanks for that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, unless I missed it, whether we got the response um, to the PCC's uh, contribution to JESA. Um, do we have those details? I, I can answer the, the, the original plans, Chair, which was that there's been a commitment in the IP, which was uh, £30 million capital expenditure from the county with a £5 million input from the PCC's office. And this was about bringing together the, the joint training facilities, the sharing of the clean part of the facility with training, the use of certain officer safety training functions, taser ranges and specific sort of specialist training functions so that was the split within the original program we are now reviewing that in accordance with uh, the police hq redesign up at project phoenix and just understanding that we're getting best value across the entirety of the corporate state in the current scheme looking at the method and approach that we take to sort of agile working use of facilities and what we need by space saving in our new ways of working and, and of course, just to add to that, that um, whether uh, it stays currently where it is uh, or whether or not there is a change of view because of the amount of money that's being discussed, whatever service is provided, we want to be in a position where it's where uh, by, it's not just used for Hertfordshire, but it can be used, i.e. rented out uh, by other fire services nearby, because that helps generate income, which helps then keep the facility uh, smart and up to date. So we are looking at, again, possibilities where we can bring more money into the budget and maintain a, a high level of service. Wonderful. Thanks very much for that. Um, John, I think, have you got a question there, John? Yes, a, a couple of follow ups on the, the JESA, because I, I wanted to make sure I understood what Morris and Alex were saying. Um, and looking at the pack we had last year and this year's pack, it looks like the programme has shifted back a few months because last year they were talking about spending circa 8 million in 22-23, and that's now just going to be over a million. But I was pleased to hear Alex committing to uh, having a fit fire training delivery by the county. Um, but 
I wasn't sure whether when he was talking, and Morris de Sinison touched on this in his last comments, whether that facility would be at the current Jessa training facility in Stavenage, or whether you're currently considering other sites, and are you actually considering sites outside the county and not keeping it within the county? If you're happy, Morris, I'll come in and answer yeah. that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll take it in reverse order, John. Uh, no, there is no current consideration to look at any facility outside of the county. Um, we've looked at those options, uh, or actually we haven't looked at what well, misleading you there. It wouldn't be a consideration based on the way that we would deliver training and the method we want to deliver training. So it's not even been an option that's been considered as such to that extent. We are looking at across the entirety of the HCC corporate estate. And I think there's there's two things that have come into it. One it would be wrong of me to come into this post and not take a view on a significant program with that level of capital expenditure at the phase it was at to make sure that we are you know getting the best value for the county the second phase of it is that the pandemic has had a major impact on everybody's corporate property strategy so it's quite right that it will create opportunities for us and I wanted to explore those opportunities just to make sure that we are getting the best value for the site. Um, so there is no decision made on leaving Longfield or not. The ask that I've made of corporate property colleagues is to look at the entirety of our estate to understand what our needs are, take stock and review what the programme needs are, aligned with police colleagues around their programme so that we can give that assurance back to you as members that we are getting the best value for county money in the decision we make in the training facility. But I think the commitment, John, if I can just reframe it, and this was uh, affirmed at Cabinet recently, live fire training facilities uh, are absolutely committed to and supported in our direction of travel and moving forward. So um, there is no question in the program about being able to deliver on that. What I'm just making sure is, is that we're getting the best value for money on the site um, and taking into consideration uh, that opportunity with corporate property. Uh, thanks for that clarification. And, and, and hopefully you're also taking on bear that, you know, the Longfield site is old. Um, and it does need work on it and it, you know, we're seeing this get pushed further into the future, and uh, hopefully this review will be done as quickly as possible. Can I can I just add, thank you, John, that's a very good point. Can I just add the difference between this year and 12 months ago is that we had uh, an election in between, uh, and there is, I believe, um, not just from um, the elected membership, but also from the new officers that we brought in, a, a, a renewed wish and desire to move this forward, but not necessarily the way it was being suggested, okay? Because spending vast vast sums of money about 30 million pounds may not be the answer to this particular uh, conundrum we have we know what we want to provide it's about how we provide it how much it costs and where it is and i think we're probably singing off of a reasonable hymn sheet in other words not at any cost but let's make sure we keep this service and i know alex wants that and um, it may have slightly caused one or two issues um, with the police commissioner but we're getting through those um but as i said we're not going to be rushed we are the big player in this and we want to get it right but alex knows he needs to be responding now uh, pretty sharpish in the next couple of months and i'm hoping we'll have something by the spring i believe we're getting a contribution from the police commissioner when i hear the money's in the bank thank <laughs> you old skeptic john you old skeptic <laughs> Chair, can I just come in on just... <laughs> sorry okay Chair. thanks Sorry, Alex, sorry, did you want to sorry to Chair, just a point, John, I think just for assurance, and I know Morris did touch on it, but there was a discussion in GAP about some small investment to make sure that our live fire training facility was up to standard. We've made that investment uh, back in September. The new fire cans have been delivered and are functioning. So um, we have plugged that gap in where there was in some of our training and that's in place up and running as we speak but absolutely take your points on the longfield site um you know it's a 1950s primary school site it's certainly served its life for us and worked through it and there's you know there are lots of sticking plasters but we have filled that live fire training gap so it is functioning fully as we speak and i have been invited to uh, attend it and attend a session with the unit put everything on and go into it but um I think it's just my political enemies trying to get me into a very hot situation. <laughs> so um, I, I might go and watch them from outside, as I did when I was the deputy member for uh, community safety many years ago. They won't get rid of me that quickly. But uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Yeah, thank, yeah th thank you very much for that. I mean, I would just add to any of the uh, new members, if they get the opportunity to visit Jessa at uh, Longfield there, uh, I've visited myself, it is well worth the visit. It's a fabulous uh, uh, training facility. Alex, um, can we organise for those people? Can we do sort of a note via, uh, via member services for those who are new who might want to visit and we can coordinate one? Absolutely. We, we can get something out and across. We've got a recruit squad training up there as we speak Lovely. and we can host a, a number of days. I think it's um, it's very insightful to understand what, yeah. you know, fortunately fires are reducing, but to understand what firefighters have to be trained and prepared for, I think it's a really useful exercise for people to see that and understand why we invest in the training in the way that we do. So, yes, absolutely, Morris, I'll make that happen. Thank you. Thank I you. think some, ex I some existing members would quite like a return visit. Uh, they would. I'll, I'll be there as well. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks for um, bringing that up, uh, Morris. Uh, and, uh, and and Sharon, I'm sure you, you're very proud to have uh, that facility in in your patch. Um, it is. Yes, yes, we are, Chair. And I would love to visit on the day when they're using uh, Councillor Bright for live fire training. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, bet, I bet you're worth seeing. If you don't mind, Councillor, I might like to risk assess that before we do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can feel a by-election coming on. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's a wonderful facility yeah. and uh, yeah. we're very proud to have it on our doorstep here in Stevenage. I'm sure. OK, that moves on. Uh, Sharon, we're, we're doing well on time um, and we can bring in... Sharon had a, um, a question uh, that hasn't been put forward to you, but... Um, another one. She, another one on uh, fire and rescue. Um, if you want to present that, obviously, if you haven't got the... The answer to your fingertips. I would appreciate that, and we could ha have something in writing. But uh, yeah. uh, far away, Sharon. And um, thank, we'll you, thank you, Chairman. Thank Chair, you, Chairman. It's, Chairman. it's David Andrews here. Can I just come in here? Um, we, we can't take written questions, uh, written answers into an evidence gathering session for for the IP uh, scrutiny process. Uh, the, uh, the written question or well, the written answer would have to come back by 11.20 in order to feed into the process. So I'm afraid I must ask that uh, the, question, the, the question is answered as, as, as fully as possible because we can't take it any other way at this stage. Thank you. Thanks for that, David. Uh, well, hopefully, hopefully um, we will get a, uh, a verbal response. Thank you. Uh, I certainly did with the last question, Chair, yes, so you thank you for that. Um, my, my question um, is, uh, it's, it, it probably applies to fire and rescue as well, but it's for the wider community safety aspects and partnership working. And it relates to violence against women and girls. And it's how the County Council's action on community safety will seek to address the issues of violence against women and girls. It's been a very high profile issue in uh, recent months. Um, and how will that be resourced? Um, there are a lot of strands to this through the County Council's activity, including a recent Fawcett Society conference that I attended, um, which was a, a Stevenage and North Hearts conference. Um, the overwhelming uh, feeling of that conference was that street lighting, for example, is a vitally important issue in uh, helping to people feel helping people to feel safe on our streets. But there are many, many aspects to this um, which relate to the partnership working between all our community safety partners. And I'd be interested to hear views on it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I think it might be just worthwhile, just for, particularly for uh, 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 newer members, just if I give you uh, just a few lines on the county community safety unit and then perhaps Alex can go into a little bit more detail for, for Sharon's question. We have what's called county community safety units um, and they work together with the Hearts Police team and they're responsible for producing uh, intelligence products to provide the evidence base for partnership strategies to address, address priority crime disorder issues such as serious violence, hate crimes, uh, drug and alcohol, and violence against women and girls. And the CCSU supports the objective under the Crime Disorder Act that requires specified bodies such as the NHS, the probation service, local authorities and police forces to work together to develop and implement crime disorder reduction strategies and to work in partnership with other agencies. It also supports the 10 community safety partnerships uh, across Hertfordshire County Council, the districts and boroughs by collating information and undertaking analysis to produce intelligent products, by, uh, by products such as the annual strategic assessments in relation to crime and disorder. And the reason why these are particularly important is because, as Sharon rightly identifies, if we are going to uh, to augment or to improve or introduce uh, uh, services 
uh, or projects or schemes to, to, to uh, at particular times specifically to uh, to um, help with issues and concerns. In this case, she's mentioned violence against women and girls. We need to understand what's going on in our towns and streets and areas to understand exactly what is needed. So she mentions um, lighting, for example, um, and it goes back to the perennial issue. No, it doesn't go back to the perennial issue of lights between maybe one in the morning and five in the morning. It's about well, what about those areas which uh, are not are dark? What about those areas like pathways, um, areas which have got high hedgerows, etc. Um, and where people just feel unsafe coming back from work in the winter or of, after an evening out. And most of us, of course, are just certainly uh, Stevenage, Potters Bar, Bush, etc. They've got train stations. I came back the other week uh, and there were people at 11 o'clock queuing to get onto trains. So there's a lot of people coming back late at night. And I think it's working together. And I've had uh, the police in touch with me recently to say, what about more lights? And they're saying, yeah, identify where you want them on to make people safe. So it is about agency working. Sharon's very good at bringing forward ideas um, where we do need to work together. She was the one who identified maybe 10 years ago now about modern slavery and everyone turned around and said, what, modern slavery in Hertfordshire, don't be ridiculous. And now look where we are and now look what we've got as a consequence. So I'm grateful for Sharon for raising this. Alex, perhaps you can give some more reassuring facts and figures around um, um, the sort of work that we can do and will continue to do, particularly against uh, in relation to violence against women and girls, which is a matter that's quite rightly come very high up on the agenda recently, but I don't want it just to be on the political agenda nationally and then forgotten about. I want it to be dealt with locally so people have reassurance uh, walking around our towns, whatever time of the day it is. Certainly. So in, in a follow up to it, I think, Sharon, you, you'll probably be familiar with a number of the boards that meet that look at this under, you know, it's not just one strand of work and this spreads across my directorate, Jim, uh, and adult services and children's services under the People's Board. The uh, review that is underway about how we approach these different strategies, ensure that we've got alignment in place is underway as we speak, and is one that's live at the People's Services Board at the moment. Um, I think in answer to some of the more local points that you raise, obviously our community safety partnerships that sit all across the county and the districts is an area where we are responding to local designing out methods, working with police in partnership and the CCSU support that work by providing those intelligence packets and dockets to go out to do the front level responding in local areas, understanding the needs, the development, the issues and what's happening with the crime types. But at the strategic level, there is a review as we speak that is not finalised yet. Uh, and I quickly scurried through my emails just to get a bit of an update, Sharon, of, of where we're at. Um, I think, David, you mentioned that we'd have until 11.20 to try and get a written note to you. Um, I will try, if I can, dependent on time, to encapsulate some of this update, Sharon, in what is happening, which boards are currently convening, what is meeting. But I think in, in assurance, I can uh, list off to you the number of groups that sit across between the Community Safety Board, Domestic Abuse Executive Board, Drug and Alcohol Safeguarding Services, Children's Partnership Board that currently meet and are all fed into our board strategy and delivery model. So, if I can, timing-wise, Chair, and you're happy, I'll try and get this short note put together in answer for you, Sharon, with some of that detail. If not, outside of scrutiny, happy to come and meet with you to brief you more in detail about what we're doing. No, a, a, a short note uh, by 11.20 would be much appreciated. It really would. Thank you. Sharon, uh, you're OK with that? That's a very helpful answer. Thank you very much, Chair. OK, um, so I think we're doing well on time and um, we can move on, finish with um, um, community safety. We can move on to trading standards um, for the final um, part of this scrutiny. Um, trading standards. Did, uh, Morris, did you want to give a, a brief intro on this one? We've got 20 minutes on trading standards. Oh, right. So you've got a bit more time. OK. OK. So yeah. look, heart, heart, look, training standards, um, a very important part of what we do. And I wish we had more people to help us do it, particularly uh, in the lives that we now lead a post Brexit. And I know that's one of the questions, but also in the way that fraud and trying to commit this type of behaviour against other people and residents is taking place, sadly, cross borders, because much of it is happening online now. Hartford Trading Standards is responsible, believe it or not, for over 250, 250 pieces of legislation 
across a wide range of subject areas. This includes age-restricted products, uh, agriculture, animal health, uh, welfare and fair trading. And the latter covers aspects such as pricing, descriptions, digital content, services and terms and conditions. And our teams also monitor and enforce around food standards and safety, intellectual property, for example, counterfeiting, uh, product safety and weights and measures. Not a phrase you often hear very much anymore, weights and measures, but it's a very important part of their work. Our trading standards team provide advice to both consumers and to businesses. And for consumers, our trusted trader scheme, which is run in conjunction with which, uh, which is good to know, is continued to attract positive responses from both consumers and businesses alike. It provides access to good quality tradespeople, whilst our advice and our support for victims of unjust trading is helping to protect consumers every day. Uh, the trading standards and fire protection teams work closely together to protect the vulnerable and also to ensure the enfor that enforcement action is undertaken with appropriate rigour. Uh, and we do that and we take people through the courts and we make sure that we advertise those successes um, to hopefully serve as a deterrent for those who might be prepared to commit some of these acts. So, Mr Chairman, that's a, just a brief overview of trading standards. That's perfect. Thank you, Morris. Um, so we'll move on to the questions. Uh, Steve, I think you have a question on this one. I do, yeah. I, I know in last year's IP there was some additional resource put in because of some anticipation of the, the impact of Brexit on trading standards. But the report also identifies that there's still quite a lot of unknowns in that area. We, we really don't understand yet the, the extent to which trading standards may be implicated in, in product inspections that might or might not be done at the border, might have to be done in Hertfordshire. Um, so given that level of, of, of uncertainty, uh, but the likelihood that there's going to be an increase in demand, uh, how, is the, how is the service going to be able to manage that? Since I noticed there's also a, a projected fall in income um, yeah, yeah. from those parts of the service which, which attract income. So how are we going to deal with that? How is the IP going to uh, yeah. enable us to deal with those issues? It's a very good point. Knowing the unknowns, and I can promise you one thing, we ain't gonna, you ain't going to get a note on this in the next 14 minutes, um, because you're right, there are so many unknowns here. But look, we know the transition period has ended. Uh, many of the impacts are still to come. You rightly identify that, Steve. Uh, and that's in part dependent on any further divergence from EU law and the extent of any new deals, any trade deals. So, for example, we had a recent trade deal. We, the United Kingdom, had a recent trade deal with Japan, which is going to result in a change to weights and measures. There you go. You had it twice in one day to allow the Japanese single distilled shoshu, taking me all morning to rehearse that, to be sold in certain specified quantities. Now, you're right, we recognise there's going to be additional pressures and an additional £75,000 has been allocated to trading standards as part of the 21-22 IP. Um, not a huge amount, but at this stage, um, it's, it's something. The trading standards team is fortunate. We've got a number of subject matter experts, people who really enjoy their work. They work regionally and nationally and share their expertise. And while the volume of work that they undertake and our operators undertake uh, remains uncertain with the funding we've received. The expertise and support networks across the whole trading standards community. The service is confident, and I'm told this, that the authority is well placed at the moment to deal with increased demands. In addition to those EU departure related issues, there's also a number of other legislative changes which will impact on trading standards. Just give you a few examples. Natasha's law, which is covering the labelling of allergens in food, pre-pack for direct sale that, that came into force uh, last October 2021. Uh, a new law covering the underage administration of certain cosmetics procedures uh, came into force uh, in October also. The Offensive Weapons Act, strengthening the law on the underage sale of knives and corrosive substances is due to come into force this April in 2022. And a law covering calorific descriptions on restaurant menus, good luck with that, comes into force uh, in April 2022 also. Uh, a law controlling the sale and promotion of unhealthy foods comes into force into October, that'll keep everyone busy, in October 22. And there's an increasing focus on construction projects and expectation that trading standards will take on a greater uh, role in this area too. Look how much work's being done, uh, raw materials issues, and just are, is the quality gonna be good enough? We do not wanna find a situation Grenfell or otherwise in 10, 15 years time. Um, but that's a hell of a hell of a stress to put on the on the service. Some of these will come with short term 
government funding. Uh, however, given the lack of qualified training standards professionals, and I made this point earlier on in relation to firefighters, there remains some concern about the service's ability to recruit sufficient staff to meet the new burdens. We continue to train new recruits, but it's a four year time frame from recruitment to qualification. So it's not going to give us immediate additional capacity. So it is a little bit of a suck it and see. We've tried to get as ahead of the curve as we possibly can, both financially and with staff in place, uh, and to work with other groups and agencies who may be experiencing or getting their heads up on where they think there may be additional pressures. And we will obviously need to report back, uh, not just to IP scrutiny in, in the months ahead, but also to council uh, as and when there are any issues. But at the moment, steady as she goes, we think we're OK. I mean, you've identified, Boris, many areas yes. of additional activity uh, and some constraints, some financial and some in terms of, of availability of the skills in resources. Uh, so that implies that unless we can dramatically increase the productivity of, of the team, which I suspect is difficult, that there are some things they do now that they're not going to be able to do. And that, and that is a worry. It's about re, is it about refocusing or can they take on so much more? Uh, Alex, that's a very good question. So I think if I can come back in, Steve, I don't think it's as simple as do we do that or not do that. There's always prioritisation of work across trading standards. I think what we've got to look at with the changes in legislation, EU legislation, there's often a replacement of legislation as well. So a lot of it is the uncertainty of what that burden will bring in the demand, but it will be about replacing legislation, not necessarily if there's 250 pieces now in the Act, another 250 pieces, there will be a lot of overlay and change. So a lot of the uncertainty is about are we prepared? Are we ready? Are we suitably trained to respond to the new requirements? But those old requirements will change as a result of it. At the same time, Trading Standards is, is not the only agency that's operating in this space. And what we work across, and Boris touched on it with our national links, the role of ports and what they're playing. They're having a significant recruitment campaign at the minute with bringing more environmental health officers, TSOs to manage things at the border. So there is that uncertainty at the minute about at what point of the process will things land. So I think my, my view is, Steve, if, if I sort of try to answer your question, I couldn't put a bid together at the minute to say, oh, I need another 200 TSOs because I can't plan and prepare for something that we don't know what we're preparing for is the training and understanding and interpretation of the legislation. So I am confident at the minute that we're structured and resourced to respond to it. Um, and I think, you know, I, I work closely with uh, Andrew Butler, who is our director for regulatory standards. And it's a it's a regular topic that he and I discuss about the preparedness and where we are at to respond. But we are confident at the minute in our approach and what we're doing. I think if I may, Chair, just while I have got the floor, is just to reiterate and sing the praises of what our trading standards team do, because they're often operating in the background. And as Morris said, you don't hear things like weights and measures and things like that too often. But I think it's a credit to them and what they deliver that we don't hear about that and the impact that has on consumer protection and the breadth of support that they play. So um, a closing comment, Steve, is that I, yes, I'm confident in the way that we're currently positioned. I think some changes with the pandemic have, I've argued, given us a little bit more preparation time that we might have not had if we'd have suddenly had the continued surge. But um, I'm, we're well linked nationally. We've got good relationships regionally. Again, Hertfordshire Training Standards is well recognised for the quality and service they delivered. So I'm confident in the space that we're at at the moment. Uh, yes, they're regularly nominated for awards. Um, they, they take great pride in their work. They hate residents being ripped off in any way, shape or form. There is such pride. I mean, there's such pride in all our offices, but I know that um, uh, trading standards, I've seen the work that they've done over the years and I've been with them and and they really, really do take it very, very seriously. So, Steve, I hope that's helpful. OK. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, and just a final question on there. Um, I'll, 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 I'll bring this one up, if I may, um, about the financial impact uh, with staff training. Um, uh, what impact will this have on the service due to this, uh, considering that uh, trading standards makes up only 5.4% of the of the budget? It's a good question, and it kind of follows on from what Steve was just saying just now, you know, recognising the pressures. There are pressures, and we need to recognise those pressures, as well as the need to train staff 
Um, and so the trading standards training budget has been protected from any significant reductions. We have to be very wary where we decide to make cuts. This would not be an appropriate, an appropriate one at all. Staff competency is the key to the work undertaken by this service, uh, which has become well used to the introduction of regular new legislation. Uh, the East of England Trading Standards Region has also appointed now a training coordinator to help a trading standards pool resources and obtain better value training across different organisations across the country. And this service has also successfully made use of the apprenticeship levy to fund prof professional qualifications. So it's about levering money, working with other agencies, economies of scale so that we can continue to produce the sorts of officers that not only we want, but that we need also. Thank you, Jeff. OK, Alex, uh, anything to add there? I think just reiterating one of the points that Morris made, I think in an earlier answer, just to say, you know, it's a roughly four year time period to train a trading standards officer. They are highly expert in what they do. They are professional witnesses uh, within a court setting. So this is not something that, you know, you can just bring someone in overnight on. But I think the relationships that we've got across the East of England trading standards region really strengthens our arm and our approach to training, cross-pollination of skills, sharing best use of practice. So there is a very well organised mechanism across the whole TS field of ensuring that we invest in training, professional mentoring, support, all of those continued professional development that you'd expect to see. And as Morris has said, the uh, changes or reductions in training is not something that's being considered because we absolutely recognise how important it is that our TSOs have to be at the top of what they're doing and, and, and fundamentally the basic benchmark to be a qualified TSO. So uh, the apprenticeship levy is something that's really welcome for me though, because it is nice to see new blood coming back in, really attracting people in. And if I may you know, use the brand that we've got in Hertfordshire Trading Standards, we, we are an attractive employer in the trading standards field because of the method and approach that the team have operated for some considerable years. Great, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I think that just about wraps it up. I'll just ask members if if, if anybody we have a we have a few minutes if if anybody has um, uh, a question they want to add in. Um, we've got a hand up, John. Yeah, uh, just following up from the um, following up from the last session talking about trading standards, and I must admit I'm I'm very impressed by the work they do on scams and everything else. Um, what to what extent have we identified where there's been a reduction in regulation as a result of no longer having to follow the EU regulations? Has there been any um, areas where we're able to do less? Because so far we're talking about, OK, Alex has said it's 250 being replaced and hopefully that. But, you know, some of that 250 regulations I thought were going to be um, torn up and thrown out the door. So surely there should be some um, reduction in regulation. I think, there's a, uh, just to clarify, Alex, so it's about having to do less because of reduction legislation, not having to do, you, know, you don't want to, it's not about our staff doing less because they don't have to do it anymore. It's about, it's about the, you know, we don't have to do that anymore, but it's not that, it's about restrictions that have changed. Uh, so uh, that that's the question, is it, Alex? So, so I think, yeah, if I can just reframe what, what I was saying, John, I, I appreciate your, your, Looking to sort of government commitments during the, the phases running up to uh, the decision on Brexit. That is the, the, the part that is being worked through at the minute to understand where that evolution comes. I think the point I was making earlier on about um, I can't give you a definitive list of what has been withdrawn and changed because that's in process. The point I was making about capacity is that um, the EU legislation will be being replaced by other pieces of legislation. Yeah. So I, I dangerously here to say confident on top, but we what we don't envisage is an additional 250 per, and I'm you know I'm making that number up in a minute, John, but it's a there will be an element of replacement, but there's an understanding of what that new piece of you know yeah. what the new legislation brings. So it's just too early at this stage to give you definitive numbers. But of course as always John, once I get more detail happy to brief you on that separately to give you that understanding. And but the, the, and the focus, of course, will remain on where the greatest risk is to the residents. Absolutely, of course. Thank you. OK, great, thank you very much. Um, so I think that just about wraps it up um, for this session. Um, I think we can go into a break.
Um, can I just, I just, am I allowed to ask a question? Uh, sorry. Got you got a last minute rush. Alex, sorry, Alex, you got a hand up there? I'm sorry, Chair. I was just going to make a comment, and I'm sort of slightly stalling for time so the question doesn't close, but an email is winging itself to David now, which is a response, Sharon, to your question earlier where we've tried to get that briefing note in. So please forgive me if there's any typos in it, but it is winging its way now, hopefully within that last minute to you. Um, but outside of scrutiny, Sharon, I'm happy to follow up uh, if you think it would be useful. Look at, look at the treatment Sharon gets. I never get emails that quick. Yeah. Look at that. Well, well done, Alex. Thank you. We've uh, got Sa Chair, Sandy there. You, do you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to ask a question. I mean, I, I, obviously, I'm here as an observer, but I'm a full yeah. member of the um, Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and so I've been watching all through. And I'm sorry if I missed it, but this doesn't seem to, I haven't heard much about sustainability um, strategy and the this this portfolio's contribution to zero carbon strategy and just wondered i think about buildings i think about vehicles i imagine that trading standards has a role in making sure that products that are sold are going to meet um, new environmental and zero carbon standards i just would like to hear a bit about that well there have been references i know alex is i'll keep it very short and let alex do with the details Please. There obviously have been references, Sandy, in relation to buildings, looking further down the line to make sure that they're pr appropriately built using the right materials so that we don't have issues further down the line. But um, so, I, but I think you would have had to pick those out within the questions that were being proffered over the two hours. But Alex, have you got a wary of time now? It's caught up with us. Have you got yeah. anything specifically reassuring for Sandy? So some very clear points just in fire, Sandy. So our vehicle fleet, we do have a green fleet. We're moving into EV capacity. We've reviewed all of our flexible duty officer fleet where we're using specialist diesel emission fuels. So sustainability is a clear strategy for us in fire. The method and approach in which we burn things within our training centres, we've changed all the uh, material that we use for burning to reduce all of that. And I think the answer is sustainable, even if I come into the JESSA programme, the sustainability review to make sure that the building's fit for future is a strand of work that will be coming into it. On your regulation point, um, yes, we will regulate at the point that that is a requirement of the legislation. So Morris touched on it. The the strands of does does a material meet? And sorry, this is a very lay way of putting it. But if it's a requirement in a piece of legislation, yes, of course, absolutely, we would regulate within it. Um, but if we work in partnership or we use some of our primary authority relationships, we would influence as a trusted partner to look at our sustainability strategy in line with what the county is doing. So it is a so I hate such a fashionable term at the minute, but it is a golden thread of what we do in our business. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, Thank you very much. Great. OK, um, David, I think you want to come in there, David Andrews. I did. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you're, you're, you're overrunning slightly and you're now actually you've forgone, yep. the, forgone the chance to have a break and you really now are quite well into the in, into the no, uh, into we, the later we can part have of the a session. Now, David. We're having a break now. Once you've finished, uh, there isn't back. time. There is there isn't there isn't time for a break. I'm afraid, Chairman. Um, you're ten minutes into the into the uh, recommendation uh, forming part of the session, so you're 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 actually substantially behind just now. So really, you should need to, you need to stick with it. I perhaps um, uh, a comfort break, but um, that's what I'm that's what I'm suggesting. So. Um, yeah, I've got it down actually as um, we're coming back at 11.30 for um, uh, putting our recommendations together. Um, so if um, thank you very much for your time, um, officers and Morris. I uh, do you, appreciate it very much. Um, and uh, so we'll have a comfort break and come back at 11.30. Is that okay with everybody? Jeff, can I just also thank, as well as officers, yeah. my deputy, Fiona Thompson, who's been quiet but been on the Indeed. call with me. A great support. Uh, and I couldn't do the work I do without her as well as the officers. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for scrutiny. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim.
we're live, Chairman. Thank you very much. OK, members, welcome back. Um, thank you for your time earlier. I think those I think that went very, very, very well. I think we had some very good responses um, from officers and the executive member. Um, everything seems to seems to have been covered very well. I, I hope you agree that um, that seemed to be the way it went. Um, moving on from here. So we now need to prepare our responses to the um, to our key lines of inquiry. Uh, um, do, you have, do you want to come in on that? Um, yes, please. Thank, thanks, Chairman. Um, sorry, I've uh, literally just popped in because uh, we had that slightly shorter break, so I was kind of rushing to put together yes. my notes. But yeah, so I, what I, I'll do quick. I'll do a very brief bit of summary of some of the key themes, and then I'll thanks. suggest areas that I think could be where your recommendations sound like they're. Go, you know, they're going, and then hand over to you, uh, members, to to discuss and, and decide what you want to do. So, I mean, that I think overall there were, you know, a lot, a lot of very, um, very helpful, detailed, and solid answers to a lot of the key lines of inquiry. Um, and you know, some there were some key themes coming out, for example, through through public health and um, the community safety side of things about the impact of, of an aging population, and it was. Um, interesting to you know helpful for members to learn about some of that um you know a lot of that prevention work that is is taking place um, um in that area with uh, fire safety and i think across a lot of a lot of i mean across all of it there was a, the theme around this kind of um you know multi agency taking multi agency working taking a system view and a, a sort of holistic view about uh, um you know how to keep Hertfordshire residents safe and well and also um, you know that real emphasis on prevention rather than just the emergency response you heard and noted you know how um, how carefully managed and well prioritized the public health work was in terms of running the Covid response work over the last couple of years alongside um, the prioritized you know essential most important services to protect residents um, and um, so now just to so there's a couple of things that I thought were just conclusions sort of worth um you know I we, we I think maybe worth passing on to um cabinet and to full council but they're not exactly recommendations and then there's a couple of things that I thought could could be more like recommendations so okay. conclusions sort of to, to pass on was one I thought um that it's important to uh, to request an update to the relevant cabinet panel on the inspection the fire um, service inspection outcomes and the budgetary impacts of that now i'm not sure i know that they said the inspection is um, taking place in february i'm not sure on the timing whether that can feed into the you know whether that will any outcomes of that will come before the sort of whole ip process is done but that's something that could be picked up um, by the the relevant panel um for that report you know reporting back on that um, also, to, for, for, um, to note the recommendations that have come out of the um, BAME Health Inequality Scrutiny Report that was published yesterday um, and, you know, highlight that, that all, it will be circulated to all members, the executive um, response for that by the 22nd of February. And then also just another kind of more practical thing was that um, it was agreed that officers will organise a site visit for councillors to um, JESA. Now, um, in the area of... Um, so, so there was a lot of discussion about staff recruitment and retention, um, especially with the impact, especially to do with the um, fire service and impact of the changes to the firefighters pension and, and also with trading standards and, and two areas there where the, you know, a, a number of years of training is essential. Um, but and I think there's a lot of discussion of that. And interestingly, that's a theme that's come out through every portfolio I think that we've looked at in this IP scrutiny so far issues around staff recruitment and retention but I thought that the um, officers provided very um, you know very strong answers and had you know there was clearly a lot of work going you know everything was clearly understood what the challenges would be and the work um, going on to kind of recruit and to train and to um, you know that succession planning work sounded like it was um, you know very thorough and um, working well and it didn't sound like that was actually an area of concern so I did wonder if in fact there might be something around um, you know taking some of the learning from that area to to some of the others when we look when 
when this goes to the overview and scrutiny um, committee on the 1st of February to look at those overview recommendations that might come out. And then so finally, just the things that, um, so that sounded like um, a recommendation. I thought um, that that something around, you know, members commended the joint working with the PCC um, around the JESA, um, uh, but there were but should the PCC contribution be less than expected or previously planned, there was some concern about the impact on the budget for the JESA. So that was the that was the one area where it seemed like, um, you know, there was an element of uncertainty that really impacted the budget. Um, there was one other thing which wasn't um, actually this 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 wasn't actually discussed, but it was something that it seemed like it could come out of with some relevance to what, what the um, the Jessa work, and so that was that if this you know if all this work is taking longer um, and you know, taking longer than planned because they're reviewing you know the the options and the site options. Um, you know, we also know that inflation is rising and cost of building materials is rising. I just wondered whether there, it was worth kind of some, some recommendation or question around what the impact of that might be and whether that will incur additional costs. But that wasn't really discussed. That was just something that I kind of thought you might want to take to the next step, you know. Of, um, but yeah, and, and that's it. That's it from me. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah. Very interesting, yes. Um, members, uh, your comments on that. Ron, I think um, you're first up there. Oh, sorry, I'm still concerned about the morphing of the CCGs into the ICS by July. Yeah. It took about two or three years to create the CCGs, and yet they've been expected to be assimilated into the ICS in about nine months or so, or perhaps a little bit longer. So uh which could put some risks to our funding so i would like to recommend that a recommendation that given the risk to fully funded i'll put this in the chat box yeah given the risk to fully funded public health services from reduction in nhs contributions continued oversight and updates through the health and well-being board and cabinet panel are essential to ensure the continued performance of the services, something like that. OK, um, so basically that's, we need to know what's happening as 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 the I see uh, the integrated services board mm -hmm. come together and, yep. and they actually take over all the functions of the CCG and will our will the funding that they agreed to as they was when they were CCGs continue, or or what will happen? Or will, if the NHS have winter pressures, will they then suddenly, you know, start to affect our funding? So I think keeping the health and wellbeing board and the cabinet panel informed of progress is actually uh, essential. Yeah, yeah, good point, Ron. I, I made a note. Of for the ICS taking control of the Better Care Fund as well. That was um, yeah, that's it. Yep, uh, yep, that's the one, isn't it? Well, yep. the base, well I, I presume. Well, we don't know yet. Uh, no. We have uh, at the last health and Man health and wellbeing board that wasn't the actual continued control of the Better Care Fund. Ultimately, it comes under the health and wellbeing board. But mm. uh, I would hate to think it becomes the sole province of the ICS going forward without. Oh. Uh, without uh, the county council having an input into it, particularly as we chair the board. Yeah, 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 good point. Um, um, but as this is about Jeff, Jeff, may I comment? Yes, Jeff, please. may I comment? Please, Colette. I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned with Ron's proposal. I understand where it's coming from, yeah. but and maybe we can be advised by the officers, but it, it sort of seems to be straying into health scrutiny and um uh, health and well-being board issues that perhaps uh while we might we might comment on something but we possibly can't this you know particular group because we're discussing budget issues we can't 
influence. I, I, I don't know what anybody else's view is on that. That's just my own personal view. I do feel a bit troubled by the breadth of what um, Ron is suggesting because it's it goes over so many different little sectors. Let's put it so, that way. So you think it shouldn't be a recommendation? It should be. I'm, I'm, I'm just um, putting the question. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be a recommendation, but I'm just concerned that is this the right place for it? You know, so I would, see, I would expect this to be coming from um, from the health scrutiny committee, not not from from this particular group. That that's that's just my view, Chairman. I'm happy, okay. Chair. I'm happy if you want to restrict my oversight to the uh, public health cabinet panel going forward. That would restrict it so that we are continuing to be appraised of what the effects of the ICS creation is having on public health budgets. If you so that is is I think completely within our remit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are we are looking towards you know a sustainable budget going forward. Uh, at the moment, that's a big risk. I think yeah. Fiona wants to come in. If yeah. Um. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I just I just wanted to um say that I cut I you know. I do definitely take the point, Ron, and you're sort of looking at that wider issue, but I do think that what Colette has um, said is correct in that I think it is kind of taking it away for, you know, this is kind of straying beyond the sort of budget scrutiny that we're really trying to focus on today. And I'm not, and it, I'm not entirely sure it, it links to literally the, you know, the exact evidence that we've looked at today and that you discussed today, uh, which is what we kind of really want to kind of keep it down to. But, um, you know, perhaps, you know, it could be something that we could put in as a, um, rather than a recommendation, we could put it in as a, you know, pass this to the relevant panel, you know, put, make a note to, to for the relevant panel to pick up, rather than, okay. a, it's not really a recommendation on the IP, I don't feel, yes. but I think we can pick it up. Well, yeah. the extent that Maurice Bright himself did mention the fact that if NHS contributions failed, then we would have to there was an agreement that we would have to hand back services and so it would materially affect uh, uh, public health services. Morris did actually mention that. In actually one of his that I, yeah, I actually said that we would have to look at services of like prioritising services and cut back where necessary, but I am That's inclined to agree with uh, Colette's view um, that, that Ron's, Ron's, I understand where Ron's coming from, but we might be best placed uh, elsewhere for further review. Do you think it's something that we should pass forward to to health scrutiny then? I do, I do in all in all honesty, because I think what you don't want to do is fall between two stools, uh, and I think it should go to health. I mean, don't forget you've got health, and I mean, I actually sit on the health and wellbeing board as well, so there is a there is a, a straddling there. But I do think it would be better suited there. I tend to agree with with officers and Colette there, not in any way um, um, distracting from what Ron said. I think it's raised a fair concern, but I think it sh it needs to be focused on elsewhere, not within what we've been dealing with today. No. No, I, I agree with that. Are you happy with that, Ron? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll... I'll, I'll it's have been a, identified, of I'll, course. So. I will have another chat at the Public Health Committee uh, Cabinet Panel on, on, on the 1st of February yeah. and yeah. Uh, give, give a reasoned argument why the, the Cabinet Panel should be kept informed of what's happening to public health funding, yeah. which I would have thought is a natural, uh, yeah. a, a natural home. OK. Yes. OK, good. Um, Colette? Have you still got your you've still got your hand up? Is that um, you want to come back? No. Uh, no. Is that, is that just, just just very briefly? Um, yeah, Rod's quite right. We do need to look at it, but I was not happy with the way that he was suggesting that we do that. I think what's been proposed is is the correct solution. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Colette. Uh, John, do you want to come back there? Um, I was going to move on to one of the other recommendations oh, okay. that Fiona suggested. We'll just finalise this one then. Fiona, have we picked um, that up okay now then? Yeah, that sounds fine. I can, you know, I can draft um, draft that, you know, once we're, we're basically once this session's finished, I'll get it yep. all down on paper and send it to um, Jeff, the chairman, to just confirm that you're happy with it. But that's yep. fine. So we it will still be picked up. It just won't be one of the budget recommendations. Yes. Um, and I just want to check, do you want it to go to Health Scrutiny Committee or Public Health Cabinet Panel or both? Or uh, what was the intention? I, I would think both. Um, yeah. 
I think yeah. I think certainly health scrutiny committee is a good idea because it, you've got that overview and you know you, well you you've got it, you know you you've got all of the trust representatives and you know attending yes. regularly to all the meetings. Um, but you know we can also it can also be made a, a note to pass to the panel as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right, um, John, do you want to come in? OK, yeah, on the Jessa, which I, I, I was pleased to see Fiona picked up on, I'm not yeah. concerned about the impact of the five million because my reading of the IP is that that hasn't been factored into the IP. Uh, there's no contribution shown in there, at least in the near term. But I think it, there are obviously the um, Alex says sensibly having a good look at it across with the, the estates people. And I think it would be appropriate if there was a recommendation that there is a report back either to overview and scrutiny or the public health and uh, community safety panel later in the year on the outcome of that um, review and the, the plans going forward. Um, um, I think there's, you know, it is at 34 million, the largest part of the capital expenditure for this portfolio and therefore needs to be kept under close scrutiny, especially as, you know, as with all large projects, there is some sign of slippage already. Yeah. Yeah, which Fiona picked up on, didn't she, with the with the work possibly taking longer uh, than planned. Um, there is an impact on um, on the budget with the additional costs. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it, that's, you know, it, it's having that report back at a later date on, on where that's yeah. going, um, but not too far into the future. We yeah. need to be moving this forward. OK. So I, just to let you know, I've captured that, um, that that you've just added there, Steve. So. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to just check if the group are, as a whole are happy with that for the recommendation to be, you know, about reporting back, um, which is slightly different to, to what I initially came up with. So I'll, I'll just change that if everyone's happy. I'm happy with that, everybody. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Steve, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I, essentially, I was going to make a very similar point to the one that, that John's made, so I think we've covered it. Yeah, OK. Good. Uh, right, moving on from that then. Um, Fiona, what would, what have we got? Um, so, staff recruitment was key, wasn't it? Yeah, but I, I As mean... As you say, it's a, it's a key message across all the portfolios, it seems. I think it is, and I also think that the responses in this portfolio were really reassuring, actually, and yeah. that's something that I don't know whether mem you know members of the group agree that I didn't actually feel like there was a there needed to be a recommendation around that. There could be definitely a note because that will feed you know I can definitely make sure it's recorded that it feeds into kind of that wider picture across the um, council. But I also wondered whether there's something to be said about um, you know like sharing learning from. The plan, the succession planning and training and things going on in this area um, across the board in other areas that we know we've heard in other evidence gathering groups that there are real issues with um, recruitment and retention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's certainly something I think I'd like to see um, come forward as a, it's a common theme. Um, so if we could include that, all happy with that. Good. OK. <clears throat> what else do you have? With, uh, do, do, do. Yeah. I think that I think that's sort of covered, you know, that's that's covered it for me. So, yep. you know, from all, from all the points I've had, I think you've you've like you've discussed them and said whether, um, you know, you, you've clarified what you actually want in the recommendation around the Jessa. Yes. And um, the, you know the reporting back um and then the other things were the sort of just conclusions of things to pick up i i think were um the one other thing that, that i think they were just kind of noted and nobody's comment on, on them so i don't i think i can just i'll make a note of them and they'll be picked up and passed on um the other thing was um whether an up, something about an update to panel on the inspection outcomes and the budgetary impact yes. of that that's the only one that we haven't really you know come back to yeah that's true yeah i mean i'm sure i'm sure we'll get that update anyway through panel but um but yeah i think that's something we we should we should highlight i'm not sure the timing so uh, morris can probably 
Elvis. It's probably about a month it takes, doesn't it, these inspections? Uh, the, the inspection itself will take about uh, four to six weeks. But the uh, the time in which we were, it may take some months before we actually get a response back. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if Alex is still on the call or not, but I'd be surprised if we get anything back um, till at least the autumn of this year, probably later. Um, but let let why doesn't Fiona um, liaise directly with Alex and then slot in the appropriate date when we get it back? But we won't we won't be getting anything back soon. I've just received um, a set of um, responses to fire inspections across other parts of the country which took part, pl place uh, during last year. So they don't like to be rushed, the uh, no. fire inspector. No, and they're, they're obviously quite intense. I mean, if, it, if it's taken them four to six weeks for the inspection. Good, yeah. Uh, yes, no stern on turn for that. Yeah, it's going to take a long time, yeah. Um, but we, we could make a note, of course, that you know, we're aware of it and we're, we're um, looking forward to the report, if you like. Well, yeah, we're waiting to the response, yeah. Something like that. Um, so that as from all from the the things that I've mentioned, and you know, I, I'm very I'm clear on everything that you'd like reported, noted, or recommended from this group. Um, so just over to you to sort of confirm and yeah. round us off. Brilliant. Okay. Um, okay, Jeff. Anybody... Yeah, if, if I can just interject, yes. I've got a note through saying the HMI report is expected in December. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's about right. Nine months is what I thought. Yeah. About nine months. Yeah, you were you were right there. Yeah. Good. December. December twenty-two. Yes. Yes, I hope so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, members, anybody want to add anything um, that Fiona can take on board in her response? No, I think we're okay, aren't we? So where do we go now, Fiona? You're going to put something together? Um, yeah, that's right. So it's all been, you know, it's all been agreed in this discussion. Yes. Like everybody in the room knows what, what we've agreed and hopefully all happy with that. And yep. um, so then I will just write, you know, I'll put it in writing. I'll send it to you, Jeff. You just yep. you know, check, give, check that that is yes, that is what we agreed. And then that will all be, those recommendations and notes will all go to um, cabinet and full council as part of their, yeah. so they'll go to the next cabinet meeting, which is when, that's when um, the executive members, the executive members, so Morris will be able to, to you know, give the more formal response to them all when you've had them in that, um, you know, in before cabinet. Yes, okay. And they'll go to full council as well. Right, okay. Sharon, do you want to come back? I just want to say that there's a kind of assumption that participating in this process means we're all 100% in agreement with uh, what's happened and there'll be nothing else we're going to raise in the future. Uh, I don't have that view. I, I, I have some questions around the process itself. So um, I just want to make that clear that um, we, you know, you agree as a as a as a group that they're the recommendations you're going to put forward. There may be others that uh, we may suggest as part of the budget process. I'm sure. Um, so, sorry, sure. thank, thanks, Sharon. And that's absolutely correct. This is only yeah. one element of the whole budget scrutiny process. And what I should have said before was that um, because this is not a for, this isn't a formal council meeting, all your recommendations will go to the Ovian Scrutiny Committee on the 1st of February. And they will ratify them. They won't yeah. discuss them. They won't change them. They just need to do that formal bit of constitutional process. But some of us are not able to participate in that meeting. Just making the point. OK. OK, well, um, I think that that probably covers it. Um, yeah. Can't see any other hands up, so thank you all very much for your participation. I thought it was a excellent morning. I really did. I think we um, we covered it very well. And Morris, thank you very much for uh, yeah. your responses and uh, the officers responses. So, um, yeah, well, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, we're carrying on. We've got two more portfolios. Uh, so